our first presentation for the day uh, titled Success with Consignment Vendors. Um, Eileen Tito is our presenter. She is the Director of Marketing and Visitor Engagement at the Boca uh, Raton Museum of Art in Boca Raton. Uh, in that role, Eileen oversees and plans the museum's marketing, public relations, social media. Uh, she also manages and trains visitor uh, experience associates and directs the retail store operations and buying. She definitely has her hands full. Uh, she brings nearly 20 years of experience in management, administration, and sales. She previously honed her skills in retail department store sales and management, similar to me, and led recruitment and placement efforts at an art college while managing an effective sales team and collaborating on all marketing efforts. Um, Eileen is self-described lifelong art and museum enthusiast, and she transitioned professionally into the museum world after completing a Master's of Arts degree in museum studies at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, in addition to that, she holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from Florida International University with a focus in art history and studio art. And an associate of art degree in art education from Miami Dade College. Girl, you got it going on. So, uh, her strong interest in art led to volunteer opportunities in the community, including a position as board member on the Arts and Public Places Arts Commission for the city of Boynton Beach. Eileen has also been a member of the Museum Store Association for the last four years. So. We put our hands virtually together to welcome you. Thank you so much, Eileen. You have the floor. Thank you so much, Dan. I'm gonna share my screen with you all. Um, an honor to be here. I was super excited about presenting this um, in Cleveland and obviously that didn't happen, And um, but this is super exciting and um, uh, happy to be here with, with all of you and to see you. Um, if you're not familiar with the Boca Raton Museum of Art. Um, we have been um, around since 1950 um, and we receive about 100,000 visitors a year. I would say we're a medium sized museum, uh, less than 50 employees uh, and our museum store is beautiful. As you can see, I'm so proud of it. Um, it was remodeled about four or five years ago and they just did a beautiful job in opening it up. My only challenge is we have a lot of walls that are windows. So I don't have a lot of wall space, but we have a lot of table space and it's very bright and airy and um, beautiful. So people love that. Um, I'll share, you know, some of our secrets. We, we do uh, make about 200,000 a year. So like I said, we're not a very large museum, um, but um, so I would, I would definitely classify it as a medium size museum. And uh, we have a, quite a bit of space for our store, which is really nice. During this whole pandemic, we shut down March 16th, and we reopened on June 3rd, which is, um, we were one of the first museums, if not the first, to open up in our area. And I can say we really have had zero issues with people cooperating with all the COVID regulations and wearing their mask and keeping distance. Um, you know, luckily we have a lot of space, so uh, having 100 people at one time in the museum um, you still have plenty of space, and we haven't even had that many. <laughs> um, I would say on a weekend day, we're getting about 120, um, but obviously not all at once. That's throughout the whole day. Um, so basically, when all this happened, like I'm sure most of you, our budgets were completely slashed. Um, there was like no more spending, obviously, you know, some things are, are super important, like keeping people employed. Um, so all expenses across the board throughout the museum were cut. Um, so that meant no orders um, for the store or anything like that until our new fiscal year started, which luckily our new fiscal year started October 1st. So we're able to resume orders and have already, you know, placed some orders with our vendors, which is really great. Um, but one of the things that has kept our mix in the store fresh has been consignment vendors. And that's really what I wanna to talk to you guys about today, um, how to manage 
uh, relationships with consignment vendors and how to include that into your store. If you already have consignment vendors, I hope you'll, you'll find some little nuggets of information helpful because we have been uh, pretty successful and have a really good system um, in place for managing those relationships and um, processing all the merchandise and keeping inventory and giving them their payments and um, how to set it up right from the beginning. So hopefully you'll find some um, tips today to help you with that. Um, so why, why are we so, so uh, such big fans of consignment? Um, in our experience, um, it's making up about 20% of our retail sales. So we're still supporting all our vendors and placing a lot of orders um, through them, um, many that are here today. Um, so, but it does make up 20% of our sales, which is pretty, you know, it's a pretty significant portion. Um, so what, what I want to talk to you about today is kind of set, set up a easy, manageable process because sometimes you might feel like it takes up a lot of time to manage all these different vendors, um, especially if they're local and, and things like that. So um, we'll talk about why it really can be an easy process and how we've managed to make it work. And we're able to, to do the whole process for all of our vendors in about four hours a month. I'm going to say four to five hours a month. That's all we, we put into it. And when I say we, um, it's myself and I do have a store manager who I'm training right now. So it's really nice because I do have uh, my plate full, like as Dan mentioned, between marketing and PR and front desk and the store. Um, I was able to get a store manager. Um, I believe it was January of this year. Um, and then we shut down. So I'm still in the training process with him because basically we didn't do anything for, for you know, a few months. Um, so we have about 17 artists that we currently work with. A lot of, I would say 95% of them are local artists. I do have one that's in Tennessee. Um, and we started off with two. Like when I came, first came onto the store uh, four years ago or so, it, I was a little intimidated by it. So I was like, mm, I'm not sure how this is gonna work. So we started off with just two vendors and it's really grown. And that's what's been able to keep the store mix like really fresh and relevant to whatever we have going on as far as exhibitions and whatever's happening in the museum is by working really closely with these artists and um, they're really eager to meet our needs. So it's really, it's really nice. Um, also during this time, we've been able to help support local artists. So everybody's struggling, of course, um, and artists always need help and support. They love being part of the museum. Um, it's, you know, it's really prestigious for them. And, and um, so it's, it's definitely feel good for both. Like it really does uh, work really well. So that's a very, um, you know, a nice, nice thing you can do is help support artists in your community. Um, also in turn, the community really notices that. So we're able to gain support from the community. They're always like, oh, I, I always know that I can go into the museum store and get something really unique um, that's not mass produced that everybody doesn't have. So um, people really start seeing that you're helping local artists and in turn, they wanna help support the museum and the museum store. Uh, another reason that we're a big fan of consignment sales is there's minimal risk. There's no initial investment. The cost on these items does not hit our books. Um, so we're able to bring in and experiment a little bit. Um, some items that I would have never thought would sell, and I really wouldn't have been able to take a risk on it because of our budget, we're able to bring it in on consignment, and then it, it just works out really well. And um, if it doesn't work out, then, you know, it's, like I said, no initial investment. And when I say minimal risk, there's always a little bit of risk that something can break something can get stolen, you know, that's really the only, only downside to it. Um, but that happens with any merchandise, really. Um, and something else we love about consignment sales is um, we can get unique custom items. We have really good relationships with the, these artists, and they'll create a piece uh, for, or a collection of pieces for an exhibition that we have, or for an event that we have coming up. Um, so it's, it's really nice that we're able to um, tailor it to what we need. So I know um, in the past, the reason I got the idea to do this presentation is because I've spoken with other um, colleagues in the museum store business and they've, they're very hesitant about working with consignment and in the consignment terms. They, 
may have had a previous bad experience or they're coming into a store, like they're a new employee in the store and they have, uh, you know, one person I spoke with told me we have about 20 consignment artists, all different artists in, in the local area and none of the stuff is selling and it's been there forever and they don't come and check on it and they don't freshen up the mix and we can't get rid of them because we've had them for such a long time. So some people are hesitant because of that. Um, or maybe you had a bad breakup, like some of the stuff didn't sell, you had to tell the artist it wasn't selling and they took it in a very not, not so nice way. So then you lose their support. Um, so the, we're, gonna, we're gonna talk about how to prevent some of these things. Or sometimes, like I know it happens a lot in our store, people walk in and they're like, oh, I wanna talk to the buyer um, because I wanna show them my jewelry collection. And maybe you're too nice to say no. Um, so we're gonna talk about some of those ways where you can, can prevent those things and, um, and have a good, healthy, successful relationship with, with both. Um, all right, so one of the first things um, that we did to set up this process properly, something that would work for us, um, we wanna make sure that we're picking the right items for our store. So we set up our own rules. Like you really have to kind of step back and say, what are the things that I want for the store that I need um, that really match, um, that really based on the mission and the needs of the museum. That's like the main thing that guides everything that we pick. And then you communicate those rules. So the way we do that is we have a new item submission form People will receive that the minute they're interested in bringing their products into the store. We have this form that kind of lays out exactly what we're looking for um, and a whole process of things they need to submit um, to make our lives a little bit easier. Uh, we also let them know that we select items twice a year. So that way they're not expecting to jump on board, you know, like you, you don't have to drop everything you're doing to add a new vendor. You do it when it's when it works for you and your museum schedule. Um, we lay out a contract with them and I'll show you sample contract. I'll show you our submission form so you can kind of see what we look at. Um, basically, you know, we, we communicate those rules. We have a contract and the contract um, lays out everything super clear. So we have a start date, a start date, an end date with this artist. And if things don't work out during that period, then you already have your out. You don't have to have you know, an uncomfortable conversation with them. Um, we enforce the terms equally. So just because someone's been there for a really long time doesn't mean the rules don't apply to them. Um, you know, we try to keep it fair and, and equal for everybody. And that really makes it a lot simpler and cleaner, uh, just more transparent. Uh, like I said, we set the expectation from the beginning. So we go over our process with them. We tell them exactly what we're looking for. We'll give them a 90 day window to sell some items. If the items don't sell, then we end the relationship, you know, or we can try with, with another item, um, things like that. But basically setting the expectations from the beginning will help you prevent any uncomfortable conversations um, in the future. So that's something we, we really believe in. Um, another thing we look for <laughs> is, is this someone I really wanna do business with? So if somebody's hounding you with 10 emails a day, 10 phone calls, wanting to show up when you don't have it, when they don't have an appointment to show you things, um, things like that, uh, those, are, those are all things we take into consideration because as you know, we get super busy, our time is super valuable. And if someone isn't really respecting that, then it, it makes it a very difficult relationship from the beginning. So keep those things in mind. Like, is this somebody that I want to work with? Is this a nice person that follows through, has good items? Those are all things that we look at just to, and it's, it could be a little selfish, but it does help or make our lives a, a little bit easier. Um, these are just some examples of a couple, I'll show you some pictures throughout where we have local artists that created items specifically related to the exhibitions that we have. Jeff Wyman uh, is a ceramics artist that we have upstairs now um, in an exhibition and he sells pieces for thousands of dollars, has been in, you know, a bunch of museums and things like that, but he has a line of more simpler functional pieces like this vase, um, and he has mugs as well that he created for the, for the museum store. So it's really nice because um, people can go upstairs, see the exhibit, and then own a piece from the artist. We also have um, 
Ed Edward Steichen um, Art Deco panels, like painted panels that are gorgeous with gold and are the size of a room. Um, this local artist, Esther Gold, she works with vintage Tiffany glass and Art Deco designs. So she was able to tailor her designs that she created for the store based on the Edward Steichen exhibition. So it's just really nice to, to work with the artist on something specific. All right, so going back to the, the new item submission form, um, I'm going to send you all in chat a link to a Dropbox that has all my sample forms. So you can kind of take a look at them and you might be able to use them or take little bits and pieces that you like. Um, just talking with other museums and seeing what their process was like when they were trying to consider a new vendor for their store we were able to grab bits and pieces from them and put this together for us. And basically, um, we let people know what we're looking for. So if their items that they're trying to bring in don't match this criteria, then they already know, okay, this might not be a good match. But basically, we let them know ahead of time. We're looking for things that are related to the museum's collection or related to an exhibition, a current or com upcoming exhibition. Um, so for example, we don't have a lot of Asian art. We don't have any Asian art on view in our museum. So if someone is trying to bring me, you know, like beautiful Asian watercolors, it just doesn't go with our museum. Like there's no real reason or connection to have it in our store. So we don't consider that. Um, we wanna look, our, our store as you saw in the photo, it's very modern, very clean. So we're looking for things that embrace modernism, good design, modern style that fits in with the aesthetic of the store. Um, so, you know, like a Victorian, uh, vase is not really going to match with the store. So this is, these are some of the things that, that we look for. Um, anything with an innovative material or innovative technology, something that's unconventional, um, but again with that modern spirit, innovative function, a cutting edge or exclusive design, um, and tested items. We don't want someone to, to kind of uh, use this as a guinea pig for their products. So we want to make sure these are tested and true items. And then toys and books, we're pretty specific with this. We like non-gender specific books that, um, and toys. So that way when people come in to shop, they're like, is this toy for a girl or a boy? It doesn't matter. We don't, you know, we don't really get into that. So what we do is we try to make sure everything in the kids section is gender neutral. So it makes it easy for gift shopping and it could be a gift for anyone. And that it's specific to art, art history or art making related. So it's, it's, Pretty simple, but it kind of outlines um, the kind of things we're looking for. And that's what we start off with. Step one, they would submit a packet that's got, um, it, got it has their justification of how their items match up to this criteria. So we let them explain to us why it fits in, in, our, in our store. We ask for images, we ask for a price list. Um, I also ask them if they are selling their items anywhere in the immediate area, because we don't want to, you know, compete with someone that's got it like two doors down. Want to make sure we have a unique mix. So congrats, you're accepted into the store. Let's talk about some terms. So this is the time where we set up that relationship. Like I was talking about, we go over the agreement. Um, everybody gets a signed copy. We set clear, very clear start and end dates. Um, and we can extend it past that after the trial period, but we want to make sure that they um, know that we're, that we're giving it a try. This relationship is not until the end of time. Um, so we, what's the, something we do at our store is we do a 50-50 split with artists, and that's really up to you. Um, some places do 30-70, 40-60. It's, it's really up to your mm -hmm. museum. Um, most artists are happy to do that. They understand that all sales from the museum store benefit the museum, and that's one of the great things about being a, a museum store instead of like a a gallery or a small boutique where you're taking a big chunk for the artist and it's just for profit. So obviously they 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 buy into that nonprofit um, philanthropy mindset and are happy to do a 50-50 split with us. We go over the payment procedures um, with them and we take responsibility for the items. So I, I have had a couple necklaces stolen, um, vases you know, a vase broken, and we do pay the artist for that because I feel like once we have it in our store, it's it's on our, you know, it's our responsibility. But that's totally up to you and how your museum wants to handle that. Um, and then the member discount, we give our members a 10% discount for shopping in the store. And that portion, that 10% comes out of our 50. <laughs> 
if that makes sense. So these are some of our best-selling artists for this last fiscal year that just ended. Kurt Brock, he's the artist I was telling you, um, is from Tennessee. He's a glass artist and these vases sell like crazy. He sells a ton of these all the time. Um, Ala is one of our new vendors from this year and she was our number two vendor. Um, she does silk scarves, all hand painted, beautiful stuff and people really love them. And um, Susan Peck, so Susan does a little bit of everything all hand painted as well, but she does these stuffed animals she does um, glasses, covers, or sleeves to put your glasses in. She does scarves. Um, so she's experimented a little bit with her product mix and it's really worked out for her. So those are just some examples. Um, some things to include in your contract. Like I said, I'll send you my sample, a sample of what we use. It's really simple, but basically on there, you wanna put start and end dates. Um, payment terms. So what we do is we let them know 15 days following the end of each month, they'll have their check. And it's really sooner than that. Um, we pull it like, for example, we'll pull November 1st, we'll pull all the October sales by each uh, vendor and let them know exactly what was sold. And then we, we send them a check right away. But that way, at least they know I'm not going to get paid every time an item sells, we're not going to turn around and write a check. So again, you set up that relationship so that it's something that's manageable for you and easy for you. That's, that's the goal. We don't want to work harder, just uh, smarter. Um, so when the, when they, on the contract, they should also include who the check is payable to. Some people have a business set up. Some people want it directly to their name. So that, that way we want to clear that up right away. Um, the artist will provide an inventory list when they bring in their items with the wholesale price and um, the retail price because they may be selling items somewhere else. You want to make sure you're keeping it consistent and the quantity of the items. So they'll bring in a list with everything that they're dropping off. Dropping off. Excuse me. And then um, the artist will cover delivery. They usually, um, whether they bring it in in person or it's shipped, like Kurt ships his basis to us, that he covers the shipping costs. And um, on the contract, we should also have your sales evaluation period. So whether you want to do three months, four months, you know, whatever you think works best for you to give it a good, a good trial. Usually, since things are so seasonal here in South Florida, at least in Boca, it's very seasonal. If they're starting in the summer, I'll usually extend it a little bit more just because our summers are very, um, very light with attendance. Um, so, you know, three months, you can play that by ear. It's really what, whatever you prefer. Um, on the contract should also be the context information for the artist, like their mailing address, where am I sending this check, um, their email, their phone number. So you don't just want them to like drop off the stuff and disappear. You want to be able to reach them and maintain that relationship. And then our business office uh, requires a W-9 if they're sending out a payment to someone. So um, if they're, someone's making more than $600 a year, they'll require a W-9. So that's you know, going to be up to you, where your location and your business office, what they prefer to do. So keeping track of inventory and sales. Um, I know it could, it could kind of seem a little bit overwhelming if you have too many artists going at once, uh, but the main thing is going to be organization. Uh, you're going to get a detailed inventory list when the items are dropped off. I have a file for each um, vendor, so that way we know exactly like where their info is and what what they want to get for their pieces. Um, I, and then we have, we use counterpoint as our point of sale. Um, I know everybody's got a different point of sale and you love it or hate it, or most people hate their POS. Um, but for this, it, it works for us. Um, what we do is we enter all the items into the, um, into counterpoint. It creates an item number, print out a price tag, very simple. When we're entering these items into our POS and in, into our inventory, we enter them with a zero cost because again, these you're not going to pay for these items until you actually sell them. So that's what's really worked out for us. And you don't want to be adding all these things to your inventory, um, messing up your valuation reports and things like that. So we enter with a zero cost. Um, like I said, the following month, we'll pull a sales report for that vendor. I usually pull a report for each individual vendor and that way it's easy to sell what each person, easy to see what each person sold, excuse me. You refer to the inventory list that they dropped off originally, and that way you'll know exactly what you have to pay them. 
Um, sometimes it can get a little confusing. Like I said, we have member discounts, but we pay them 50% off, off, off the retail price. And then basically we request a check once we've gathered the report, see exactly what our, each vendor sold, then we request a check to be sent to them um, and our business office does that. So only the cost of the items that sold actually hit your books, um, so, which is great. And then we email the artist with the good news, let them know what's sold and um, let them know a check is, a check is on the way. And, um, and then at that moment, we think of what's the next step with this artist. Do we still have enough inventory? Do we need to set up a meeting with them to kind of get some uh, more product in the store? Or perhaps things aren't going so well. So sometimes you have to have a conversation um, and give them some feedback, whether it's about pricing or changing up the mix in the store um, and give them a, an opportunity to kind of, um, you know, get some sales. All right, so this is a, just a sample inventory list, super easy. Usually the artist fills it out when they, when they come in and they're dropping off their pieces. Sometimes jewelry artists will come with all their trays and then we pick what we want, usually start with like 10, 15 pieces. And um, then they fill out the form and then we know exactly what we're gonna sell it for, exactly what the cost is and what they're gonna be paid for each piece. And, that, th and we keep this sheet to enter the information into our um, POS system. I usually write down the, the item number that's assigned and just makes it very easy to keep track of the pieces. And this is just a sample sales report um, that we get from our system. As you can see, um, hand-painted silk scarf. She sold two silk scarves, a parasol, and a stuffed silk animal. And you can see what the retail price is for that. So we pulled this for each vendor, and that gives us um, an easy way to figure out what we're going to pay each person each month. And we keep a copy of that. So with the consignment vendor pieces, merchandising is key. I'm, you know, obviously with all your merchandise, but how you display it is, um, is really important. And one of the things we found to be the most important is highlighting the local artists with signage. Um, very simple sign. You know, we just print these here as, as we need them. Um, highlighting them because somebody coming in from the street is not going to know, oh, this is actually a local artist or this, um, you know, a unique piece to the area. So it's, it's really cool. And we also, so we'll do these little red um, local artist signs that highlight the pieces, but we also do um, a little artist bio. And I usually have them send me um, just a brief little bio about their work, about about the pieces. It could be a quote. It could be about their process. Um, we found that people really like to know more about the artist and know more about what they're buying and kind of like what's the story of this piece. So it's, um, it's something really cool to highlight. So marketing and promotions. Um, these local artists are great, are great at self-promoting. <laughs> so it really does help you. Um, they post it on social. Social media is a great free tool. So we'll, we'll highlight them. We'll make a post. Hey, um, Millie Hirschman just brought in her new collection and we'll put pictures of that. But what's more exciting is when Millie posts it herself. So you're not just talking about yourself. You have other people talking about you. Um, so it's really nice. Or people who follow her will share it as well. So um, we take advantage of that and we always work with them to help promote it. Um, once we set up the display, we send pictures to them. Um, they love to see that and they love to um, kind of see how everything turned out. Um, some of the things we do is that, and, and having these local artists nearby really helps with shopping events. So like trunk shows, meet the artist, artist demos. We've had um, ceramic artists come and do demos. We've had a uh, purse signing. So this is a picture from a purse signing where um, Julie Feldman shows signs or, you know, the, the purse inside and people really like that. Um, so yeah, it just makes it very easy to do marketing um, with them. Uh, another great thing, like I mentioned, is gaining community support and supporting local artists. So the signage, like I said, really helps to raise that awareness. People coming in, they don't know um, who's what. So you really got to point it out to them and say, oh yeah, this is local artists. And we constantly get comments about, 
oh my gosh, it's so great that you have so many local artists in here and that you help support the local artist community. And that's something that's really unique um, to our mission, our museum's mission. In 1950, like I said, it was founded by artists and it started off as an artist guild in the area, continued with the artist guild. We also have an art school. So supporting local artists um, and being a resource for them is, is really important to us and the community loves it. It's also great for PR. Um, so for example, this is something uh, Discover the Palm Beaches um, added one of our artists into their holiday shopping guide. And then the artist shared the information. So it's that other people talking about you, which is, which is really great. It also leads to great collaborations. Um, you know, like I've mentioned, they've create, artists have created pieces for our um, exhibitions. We have artists that have um, met through the store and work together now, like we'll display matching necklaces with the scarf and things like that. So it's, it's really, really fun um, as well. And it really can help your, your museum. These are just some examples of artists that are promoting themselves by having pieces in our store. So Elise Ryan had a really great um, trunk show we did with her and it's all these like beaded bracelets and she sold thousands in one day, which we were, we were surprised, but she has such a big following. She has a bigger following than we do. So it was really a, a good partnership because her followers then came into the museum and, and really helped us. Um, so it was really nice and, and proceeds of all her sales actually go to charity. So it's a good organization to get behind. Uh, Susan Pellish, she's one of our docents and she is a glass artist. But what she did is she created these like paint splatter, paint buckets and trophies with alligators coming out. We had uh, Imagining Florida exhibition. So she created these specifically for the exhibition and a lot of her collectors came into the store just to buy them. So we still have them even though the exhibition's gone because of her following. Um, so it's really nice. And Andrea Huffman is a, um, she's a textile artist that teaches at our art school. Um, so every time she brings in a new set of pillows or purses, um, she posts it on social, her students come, and like I said, her following um, really helps to promote the items. Just a couple more examples that, that we'll post um, when we get new pieces in the store. You know, it's wonderful having Alyssa in the store today, and this is during one of her trunk shows. So again, um, we use them as a resource. We use the artists to help not only set up their displays, um, help during events and help promote. So it's a good partnership. All right. So um, just some of the main takeaways from the presentation that I hope you'll, you'll, you'll definitely try to um, incorporate some consignment sales into your store. I hope I had a convincing argument on how it could be easy and manageable. Um, the main tips really set your rules from the beginning, you know. Um, manage those expectations so that you're not arguing with someone or they get their feelings hurt when you have to pull them out of the store. You know, numbers are numbers. So if things are selling, it's a great relationship. If they're not, then you have to have that tough conversation. But hopefully setting it up from the beginning um, can really make it easier for you. Um, be organized. That's one thing that's super helpful. Sometimes the artists will just come in, run into the store and say, oh, here, I'm dropping off these new scarves, but I got to go. Um, you know, making sure that you have the itemized list of what you're getting, that they sign off on it, you know, just so everybody is aware of what's going on is, is going to make your life easier and communicate. So we always, we, we touch base with our artists at least once a month and it could just be a quick email like things are going great or, you know, things aren't selling so great. Let's talk about pricing or let's, you know, let's set up a meeting where you can bring in some new pieces. Um, so yeah, communicate set your rules, um, and uh, it, it should be a really nice relationship. So do you guys have any questions for me? I think there are some we questions. Oh, go ahead, Eva. No, go on, Scott. Um, we did have a couple of questions. One of okay. them is, um, other than individual makers and local artists, have you ever worked with the vendors on a consignment type situation? Yeah, absolutely. We actually with Italianissimo who's here and they're MSA members, they're amazing. They have um, some pieces in the store that we always have that are just on consignment, like pretty much 
continuously um, from their collection. So it works out really well, especially with some vendors that are like, oh, I'd really, you know, love for you to try this new piece, but I know your, your budget is maxed out. So a lot of vendors are really willing to work with us in that way. But Italianissimo is one I can think of off the top of my head that has been super successful. Um, they're also wonderful because they're very local for us. They're, they're like walking distance almost. So they help us with events. They help set up display. Um, mm -hmm. So Mauro and Diane are, are awesome and, and very flexible to work with. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think it's just a matter of, of asking even some jewelry vendors that have wanted us to start off by placing mm -hmm. a huge order. We're like, we really can't afford to do that. We don't have such a big budget um, or I'm not really sure that this is going to work for our audience. Well, they say, well, let's try it. And it's a, it's sometimes it's a, it's a good way to start. So, yeah. Good. Thank you. Um, we also had uh, someone who was curious as to uh, who the middle artist was again in your presentation of your top sellers, your three top sellers. Oh, okay. Yeah. Let me go back to that. I do have to say you have some wonderful artists. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It's, you know, it's, it's been a process, but I can, I can honestly say the ones that we have right now are doing really well. So this is Ala uh, Krimen is her last name. And um, she's here in Boca and she's doing um, these beautiful scarves. I mean, she even did sun hats over the summer that I didn't want, again, one of those items I didn't think was going to sell. Like I personally wouldn't wear a sun hat, but they, they sold. <laughs> they sold. She sold us a bunch of hats. Painted. I'm sorry? Is it embroidered or is it painted? It's painted. They're all hand painted. Mm -hmm. Gorgeous. Yeah. And she's a traditional like fine art, fine artist that does paintings. And then she started doing it in the scarves. And, and that's one thing we look at is functional items. So we don't have a lot of just paintings in the store. We don't have any paintings really. It's what's functional. Mm -hmm. Um, what can what can people use like a piece of art that they can use? Yeah. Uh, we had another question: Is uh, do you allow artists to sell at re um, set a retail price, or do you uh, work with them on setting the retail price for the store? Usually, we ask them. You know, we we ask them what's what's the retail price? What do they sell for? Or they'll usually tell us what they want to get. Um, they like Ala will say, "Well, I, I really want to get like." you know, 60 to $75 for this scarf. All right, right. So we said, you know, we just double it as a starting point. And then some artists that if they're newer and they're not sure what to set it at, you know, we, we again, we asked them, what would you like to get for? We want to make sure they're getting a fair um, cut. Um, but then we work with them. So for example, if they say, well, you know, I really need to get $80 for this, but, um, and I said, okay, well, let's start it. Let's start it at that price. And we'll adjust if we see in two, three months things aren't selling, or if we hear comments from from visitors, we we let them know. And and that's one of those things I was saying. It's just communicating with them. A lot of them are willing to, you know, they they really want to be part of the museum store, so they're they're very flexible and happy to to adjust their prices. I think that we've only had like one or two vendors that are like, nope, that's my price. And I say okay, <laughs> but yeah, most of the times they're pretty flexible. It kind of goes hand in hand with that, but if it's outpriced to your market, are you willing to work with them? If it's over, you know, or do you, you, you I think you mentioned that you set the price and then you kind of give it a chance, but if they come in and it's really high, do you just let them know like this isn't? Yeah, we do. And we, and we've had to do that because sometimes they're like, you know, it's, it's a three, $400 necklace and we know that it's not going to sell. Um, we tell them, okay, so usually we see that jewelry will sell better if it's under $250. Um, you know, people aren't as hesitant. And and like and and if they're really stuck on it, I say, okay, let's try it. Let's try it for a couple months and see where, where it goes from there. And just communicate with them, give them the feedback. And if and if they don't want to drop the prices, that's that's okay. That's okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we, we you know, we, we try to give them some advice, but you know. Good. It's up to them. I don't, I hate, I, you know, I hate to um, tell an artist like, oh no, that, you know, that price isn't good. You know, they know what it's worth. So I don't, we don't really want to um, offend anybody. So it's just sure. really like, yeah, let's try it. Yeah. Um, we also had a question. How do you extend trial periods for um, the hits or, and uh, new contracts? And how so do you usually, handle the 
Yeah, usually what we do is we'll send a revised contract back out to them, you know, talk about that and say, hey, things are doing great. Let's extend it to the end of the season or let's, you know, let's do it for a year. Usually if it's, good, if, you know, really good the first three months, we'll do it for a year and then we revisit it. And, and some artists, you know, like Kurt has, that you see on the left, he's been with us for about seven years now. Wow. Um, yeah, so it just, some of them work really well. We kind of just keep it going. Um, and some of them are, are like, oh, I don't really need a, a new contract. I would say that the, the dates on the contract are going to be important for you for that trial period, because then you can just say, okay, trial period's up. Unfortunately, it didn't sell so great. So, you know, we can try again in the future um, or something like, or with different products. Um, but yeah, usually we just send out a revised um, contract for a year at that point if things are doing well. Excellent. Um, we had a message from Frank. He says, hello. Oh, hi, Frank. We have a patient to you. Yeah, we got um, great, great bags from Frank for uh, our store. You, you mentioned social media uh, promotion and artists. Do you ask the artists to promote Boca Art Museum events in their art social media post? Yes. Yeah. So both. So we'll, we'll either they post and we share it or we'll post and they share it on their page. Usually for a trunk show, um, if we're, we're setting it up as an event on Facebook, we set them up as the co-host. Um, so that way it'll show up on, on both our pages. Um, but yeah, we, we, the, I'm gonna say 80% of our artists are on social media and they are happy to share it. Um, and their followers you know, come in and, and are happy to see them in the store and it's, it's really nice. I have a question. Um... In regards to, um, do you have a set schedule for your trunk shows? Like, do you say you're going to do one a month? Do you say you're going to do it at the beginning of each month or the 10th of, you know, do you have kind of a program like that that keeps you on track or is it just kind of random? So it, I'm going to say it follows our museum event schedule mostly. So it'll be if we have, um, let's say on a Saturday. Well, right now we're not really doing any trunk shows, you know, because of this whole thing. Um, our, you know, our next like in-store in event is going to be Museum Store Sunday. So we're excited about that. And even then we usually have a guest, but we're, we're trying to limit that this year. We might do like a virtual presentation or something along with the day. Um, but we try to match it with things that are happening in the museum that I know bring in a crowd. So that way um, the artist has a lot of people to, to interact with. Because sometimes a Sunday afternoon can be kind of quiet. But if we have music in the museum or we have an, a lecture going on, then we know already 150 people are going to come to that, then we will hold the event on that day. And we usually try to do um, during regular times and regular season about one a month. Fantastic. Yeah. Anyone have any uh, other questions? You can type them into chat. You could also just sort of shout out if you need to. Absolutely. Yeah. And my email address, if you guys want to you know, send any, any other questions or, um, you know, any, anything specific you'd like to ask, be more than happy to, to connect. Eileen, thank you for doing this presentation for us. It was, um, I thought that the timing with everything that we've been going through, it just seemed as though consignment was going to be such a reasonable and important answer to a lot of people's questions and concerns about how they were going to be successful um, for the upcoming period that we're in. So thank you for sharing oh, that. And, thank you, um, guys. Thank you. I hope it, it was helpful. Yeah. Um, and please stay on. Um, uh, I mean, I hope you'll be able to stay on. But... Yes. Um, Ari Lowenstein is going to be giving us a presentation. Jackie's going to introduce him now, I think. So thanks. Thanks very much, Eileen. Thank you all.